Good afternoon. And today I thought we would take a look at this uh, witch magazine from June 1984, which, um, no pun intended, uh, which I've only just found that I uh, actually have a copy of. I ordered it some time ago and uh, didn't forget that I had it, but thought I'd lost it. Uh, there's something else which we'll look at later in this video, which I also thought I'd lost, but was very happy to have actually relocated. Um, you may actually sort of find some uh, tips or um, ideas of what those items might be in the previous video, which was servicing the uh, TX-10. Hopefully part two of that will be coming at some point. So we're going to be taking a look at 22-inch colour televisions, teletext and stereo on test. So let's have a look. We are looking for page 246. So we're on 243 here. It seems, um, if I remember rightly, these witch magazines were actually available um, in uh, sort of binders. You can actually sort of collect them as a series of magazines. I've also just noticed something else rather exciting. We're going to take a look at page 276. And we're going to take a look at the Renault 11 and Fiat Strada 2. Two family hatchbacks aiming for the 4,500 target. But let's take a look at... 246, our verdicts on 13 teletext sets and on whether teletext and stereo sound are worth the extra money. Yes, they are. I'll say that immediately. Or I think they are anyway. So let's go and get straight in. So let's have a look at the sets that we'll be looking at. So we're going to be having a look at this Doric CU56406 DT at £430. This Hitachi CPT2238 at 460. That was a rather handsome ITT at 480. That would probably go well with um, that, actually. The uh, VR3984. That would be a good pairing for that. Uh, we've got one of my personal favourites, the um, Bang & Olufsen... Uh, sorry, the Ferguson 37463. Another personal favourite of mine, the uh, Bang & Olufsen 7802. It says here, good but pricey. But if the uh, this set here, which is the 7702, is anything to go by, good but pricey actually means good, pricey, yet quite possibly the best home for a 30AX tube. Or the 540X series, as it's known. So... Let's have a look and see which ones they actually rather like. So, gives you all the details here uh, that you, as a buyer of a television set in the 1980s, would actually quite like to uh, know. It does mention Prestel, which is interesting. Um, and that was still a thing then. Uh, it also mentions various inputs that you can get. So it does mention initially here some details about um, RGB, uh, composite RGB, um, obviously the standard aerial connector, etc. It says here that a 22 inch screen is too big for home computer use, which is a fair comment. Talks here about the audio inputs, that was something that's on the Ferguson Super Sound. Uh, my 20 inch has got audio inputs, or two audio inputs actually. Um, audio and video outputs, uh, sockets for external speakers, etc. And also, it's starting to talk about uh, SCART Peritel Vision. Um, also known, well, it's known as SCART, or nowadays, but was also known as Peritel Vision or Pera Television, or the Euro Connector. Um, and that was something that was coming in from the continent, and not really something that uh, we saw all that much in the UK, which is why, for example, this Ferguson TX-10 here still had um, RF-only inputs. However, the Ferguson Professional Series, which is basically a TX-10, but in a monitor-style chassis with the A56540X tube and separate loudspeakers actually did come with a SCART interface and I think SCART interfaces did exist that you could actually purchase to get installed into these 
I know I've certainly got a SCART interface for the TX100, sort of just known as the Peritel Vision, Peritelevision interface. So, a little bit more about uh, other various bits and pieces, talking about the sound quality, picture quality, etc. And also, one piece I like is all the items about the uh, remote controls. I'm just going to sneeze, which is a bit annoying. Uh, thankfully, I managed to hit pause before I actually did sneeze. I was lucky. So, I quite like this Doric remote control of all the colour coding. It's very sort of early 80s, late 70s. I remember once I had a Zanussi set which had a similar remote, but it had these really cute little round buttons on it. Stupidly, I broke that set up uh, when I was a lot younger and first becoming interested in televisions and it's a regret of mine is they're incredibly rare these days. I don't think I've found, found another Zanussi CRT TV. Um, certainly not in this country. Also got uh, the Fidelity remote control here which, you know, looks, well, a little bit cheap, let's say. Uh, also got the rather nice uh, Ferguson remote there. Uh, I have one of those for my um, Super Sound set upstairs, and um, funny enough, quite conveniently, we got the Mars bar, which is the Bang & Olufsen remote that you can see here. Uh, this one is actually for the stereo set, uh, whereas mine is for the mono set, but there's not really much difference. They're still very nice, sturdy remotes with, uh, underneath this cover, a single 9 volt battery. Um, I used to have the white line version which is basically this but with um, a white metal and plastic case. It's a very stylish remote and very substantial as well. I do quite a bit of damage with that if you uh, so desire. So a little bit more information. Um, also talks about some of the harder to find sets. So let's have a look at and see what it says. So the good value sets are uh, the Hitachi and the Doric. Um, having stereo adds to the cost and usually the size of a TV if you... Uh, yeah, sorry, usually and usually the size of a TV and if you've got a good quality audio system we think you should carefully consider buying a mono set with an audio output. Table B, which is somewhere, is it this? I don't know. Um, so, but of our stereo sets, the Bang & Olufsen is very good, yet pricey. The Ferguson at 500 and the ITT at 480 are a lot cheaper and did pretty well in listening tests. And yeah, I've got to agree with that. The Ferguson does produce quite a nice uh, sound reproduction as well as some um, picture reproduction as well. Certainly my one does, although mine is the 20 inch version based on the TX9 chassis rather than the 22 based on the um, TX10. Actually, funnily enough, another set I have which I really need to dig out at some point and start doing something with is this Sony KV2256. I need to do a little bit of soldering on that. It does come with a SCART socket, which is quite nice, and it's another very nice, very pleasant set. There's the dreaded Amstrad CTV 2210, uh, a set that was very popular initially, however didn't really last the course and tended, you tended to find that they were raided for their tube. Uh, they used an A56540X green label tube, and those green label tubes were with a bit of tweaking, pretty much a direct fitment for the Bang & Olufsen and the Ferguson. And uh, they were, you know, well worth uh, using for those two particular sets. And, yeah, I think we're at the end of that section. So we've just got this section here now about blank video cassettes. Interestingly, we're talking about um, the first picture that you see is actually Betamax. So, yeah, another little interesting article. So let's have a look and see if we can find this article on the Fiat Strada and the Renault 11. 
which was on page, where was it? Wow, 1980s trainers. Ah, there you go. Look at that, family hatchbacks. The Renault 11 and the Fiat Strada 2. Cool. Motoring at the very edge of excitement. Look at the svelte lines of that Renault 11 there. And the uh, equally svelte Fiat Strada with its facelift front end. Wow, so nice. Actually, in fairness, the 11 wasn't a bad car. Um, they tended to sort of last fairly well and didn't really rust very much. The Strada, eh, not quite as good in my view. I tended to sort of see a lot more of those die at an early age, whereas the 11s tended to sort of just go on until they look very sort of shabby, usually sort of faded plastics and um, faded paint, but massively severe rust. I can't really remember seeing one with uh, huge amounts of rust. They did seem to last the course fairly well. However, at this particular juncture, the competition from uh, Britain was the rather oddly named Austin Rover Ital Saloon. It's basically a Morris Ital, but for some reason, because Austin Morris were re un undergoing a rebrand at the time, it was badged as the Austin Rover Saloon. It was imminently replaced by the Montego and the Maestro at this time, so this was probably the last time it was actually sort of really referenced as a competitor for these two. The Maestro was seen far more as a competitor for these two vehicles and uh, just as worthy. Uh, however, rust again was a potential issue as some other early build quality issues sort of typically was were. Sorry, The Astra was a very viable competitor pretty well built and in my view a cut above the comparable Escort. Um, at the top you had the Volkswagen Golf and sort of somewhere in the middle you had the um, Talbot Horizon and the Nissan Sunny and also the Mazda 323. Again sort of pretty good sort of range of options. More offbeat was the High and Die Pony which was a very strange unusual option at the time and certainly not one that uh, um, many people sort of considered certainly second hand as a good second hand buy but they did sell fairly well new mainly due to that incredibly cheap price and the relatively high equipment level that you tended to get for the for the money so sort of coming through all the uh, interesting car facts there now in the 11 range the one that um, I always remember was the TXE because my late uh, stepdad and the 11 1.7 TSE and that was a nice car I rather liked it it was pretty comfortable as the they often were and nicely appointed inside however it seemed to go through drive shafts on a regular basis the turbo was uh, an unlikely uh, performance contender and used the same engine as the Renault 5 turbo and really was you know, quite an impressive machine. Only available in three door in this country. On the continent, you could get them in the five door. In fact, in America, with the uh, Renault Alliance, you could actually get the um, 11, or uh, I think it was more ba nine base because it was a, uh, a saloon shape. You could actually get the convertible version with a two liter engine, known as the uh, Renault Alliance GTA. And that was certainly a very interesting car. Got some nice photos here of the uh, various interior appointments. And I've got to say, not really too keen on that interior. However, the 11, I don't know, the interior, I just prefer the interior. I think if I had the choice between the two, I probably would have gone for the 11. Strada, nah, not really, unless it was the uh, one of the Abarth versions. But if I was only had the option of these two cars in base level trim probably would have gone for the Renault in fairness and there we go and let's see what they would have gone for so what do they say so summon up for the Strada much improved over the original car the Strada 2 is now an acceptable family hatchback 
keenly priced, but it must establish that its reliability, bodywork and depreciation have improved before it can be recommended. So summing up for the 11. Though it has some serious drawbacks, the Renault 11 doesn't have much in its favour either. For a similar price, there are better, roomier family hatchbacks. Well, that's uh, that's my opinion completely discounted in that case. I won't be having either. I'll have to uh, go for one of the other options uh, if I have to go back and have a look at the other options, competition. Uh, mm, I'm going to play it safe and go for the Astra. Or the Mazda 323. Probably the Astra, actually. I was going to go for the a base. Uh, well, if I, I'm not allowed to go for one of the nice ones, I'd have to go for the Astra. If I was allowed to go for one of the nice ones, I'd go for the GTE. Um, or I think it's a bit early for a, an RS Turbo Series 1, unfortunately. Otherwise, that would be very high on the cards. I think that was more around 1985, actually. I'll hold out for a year and save a bit of money and get an RS Turbo or a GTE. Yeah, that's what I'll do. And uh, there we go. That was um, that copy of uh, Witch Magazine from June 1984. So in part two of this video, um, I've gone back again to 1984 and um, basically picked a load of things off the shelves of the local radio rentals shop. So I'm thinking of uh, possibly getting one of these rather nice new fangled stereo VHS machines such as the uh, the 8941. I mean the features that it has are truly exciting and um, I'm very looking forward to being able to record a uh, 14 day um, 40, oh, sorry record over the period of 14 days and eight events. That means I will be able to go on holiday and record, hopefully, um, the episode of um, Bullseye on each of the Sundays and also the episode of Minder, which uh, I think was also on a Sunday as well at this time of year that I'm imagining in my uh, head, and possibly Highway to Heaven as well. That was uh, another great show that uh, I used to watch when I was younger. So, to go with that though, um, I need a suitable television. I could also save a bit of money and possibly rent the 8940, which uh, has the same 14 day 8 program timer and stereo sound, but is a top loader with a cable remote and a little bit cheaper. So before we go on to any of this other stuff, I need to find a suitable television for which to watch all of this when I get home from um, wherever I've gone on holiday. Um, perhaps Tenerife or somewhere like that on a nice package holiday so ah, there you go that's the set with which I will be uh, pairing my 8940 or my 8941 the uh, stereo bared super sound based on the TX10 so uh, I'm gonna go oh I could go for a TX9 version which has got the 20 inch screen that's the one I've got upstairs but because I'm rich and can afford all of these things in the 1980s I'm going for the 26 inch you could only get the 26 inch on rental and that makes me just a little bit better than my neighbors as I'm sat there with my uh, my top of the range Vauxhall Astra GTE and my uh, top of the range VHS machine and my top of the range wood trimmed bared television with a 26 inch A66 540X self converging tube yes I've made it I have made it and I'll also have it on this stand as well so I can put the VHS machine underneath there and then uh, I'll get that set up ready for uh, going on holiday however for the kitchen I'm after a portable and um, I quite fancy the look of this, this uh, rather nice little TX9 affair. So that is available in 16 inches. And um, it also has a special AV channel for use with the video. And uh, a fold away loop aerial, which will be useful because I don't have an aerial connection in my kitchen. 
and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get quite good reception. I also think it's got teletext, which is uh, super exciting. I could actually get the uh, uh, teletext there. I've got the remote control. I can actually borrow the remote control from the living room if uh, I mislay the one in the kitchen. So that's that's good. And um, what else do I need? Um, I could. I need something to go on holiday with to film my holiday exploits and the uh, the various nice views and things around Tenerife, such as that volcano thing that people tend to visit. I've forgotten what it's called. I could rent one of these. This is the uh, the Ferguson VHS Video Star VHS C camera, the Free V41. However, I might have to buy this. I don't know if I can rent it. But, uh, I could uh, film a very 1980s style wedding with uh, these two people here. Um, I could uh, cover my nails with nail polish and uh, use the controls like that. Or I could film my fictional 1980s family here whilst wearing this really good great jumper uh, with shirt combo sporting a semi mullet. Always rather nice in there filming some action on holiday there again with my imaginary family using this and also I could watch it on my on my super sound there with my family and uh, a plant and some light 1980s tasteful furnishings yes very nice very nice indeed however going back slightly further in time I could rent this the uh, 8924, which is basically a 3V23. Very nice. Uh, VHS model 3V23. Similar to the 8924, but with a light silver finish. So you had two different versions. You had your dark grey, which was your rental, badged up as Baird, multi broadcast, etc. Or you got your Ferguson version, which was a light grey finish. And uh, you could also get this in JVC flavours, or the Nordmand V500, which for some reason, I don't quite know why, was a good hundred or so pound more than the JVC and the um, uh, Ferguson versions. And actually, on these later decks here, the uh, 8941 is at the top and the 3V31 is below it. You can actually see the difference between the rental and the uh, consumer grade decks. So, equally bizarre was uh, this. This is basically, I believe, a Thorn 9000 based TV with the ultrasonic remote yet very basic and uh, was quite cheap to rent. That was the uh, Baird Model 8101. Um, I'm not sure what it actually was sort of aimed at. I got a feeling it was um, basically a small 20 inch set aimed below the new TX range, but in this sort of nice monitor style uh, chassis or monitor style case to make it sort of look more contemporary. You also had a digital readout for the uh, the channel number selection as well. Very odd little set and I do remember my parents having one on rental uh, back in the 80s. So these were the ones that you sort of tended to typically see. These were sort of your more um, sort of middle of the road medium spec sets. So you had the full feature remote control but you also had the uh, the teletext option and you could get those in 22 inch or 26 inch again with the excellent self-converging 540x tube um, the tube was so chosen because it had very good uh, reproduction with teletext a very clear very concise reproduction and coupled with the TX10 chassis they actually did pretty well and from what I've read, not many of them broke down, and they were very good within the market for the rental market, rather. So here we've got this nice little one here, another bed. I think this one is a 20, 20 inch, so it's basically the 20 inch version of the one which we've just seen. I think these use the A51 580X uh, PIL tube. 
again you've got that fully featured remote which is quite nice and this is rather odd this is a portable with an alarm clock slash radio so something suitable for the uh, the bedroom and uh, you could hook it up to a video recorder if you so wanted British TX technology that's basically a TX9 uh, probably one of the earlier TX9s, so might have been one of the ones with the Thyristor power supply. Gives you an alarm call feature as well, which is interesting. Also, that's interesting, TV and VHF radio aerials. Did it have a, it had a built-in radio as well? How nifty. That, that I did not realise. That would be well worth finding. That's a nice little set, actually. wonder if any still uh, are still left. If I could find one, I would very much like to have one. It'd be a lovely little thing to have around. Now this is an interesting deck. This is the 8930. So this was effectively the uh, non-stereo version of the 8940 and this one is sort of more closely related to the Ferguson 3V30. So you've got the wired remote, um, you've still got the 14 day 8 program timer but just to make it a little bit more affordable for the rental market, it did not have the linear stereo sound. However, it does have the uh, Dolby noise reduction. Now we're coming on to the more luxury end of the market. We've got the 3V32. So the 3V32, very similar to this ITT and is pretty much the rebadged JVC 7955 I want to say very nice deck, four heads uh, I think two heads long play, two heads standard play um, remote control, not as a fully featured remote control as the predecessor, the Ferguson 3V23 but a very nice deck besides you can see again that the consumer versions were the silver over uh, light grey and the rental versions that dark grey over silver and again this one you had the 14 day 8 program timer but you could record up to 8 hours and this would have been a far better machine to use with that 14 day 8 program timer now this was a weird one this I am led to believe is a Thorn 9600 chassis. So, from what I've ascertained, the 9600 was a development of the 9000 for use with larger than 20 inch tubes. So, this rather attractive console thing with the, uh, the sliding door was aimed more at an end of the market that was more used to traditional te appearance televisions with the, the sliding door on the front. They weighed an awful lot but they were rather handsome looking things. They did come with the uh, the infrared remote control and they were available with 26 inch tube or a 22 inch tube. I'll be honest I'm not sure what type of tube they use. If it was the 30AX, 20AX or some other tube that I'm not aware of. They were capable of um, utilising uh, teletext and CFAX. And apparently they had 16 channels, including two AV channels for video, which was quite a nice uh, feature for the time. Now we've got the traditional, seem to see them everywhere, later TX9 portable. So I'm not sure what year these would have been. Let's see if there is, looking at that, 1984, judging by that date stamp on the bottom. Um, but these were sort of almost in every teenager's bedroom during the early 80s. And for good reason, they were really good little sets. Uh, you still see quite a few of them around now, actually. A lot of the sets that come up on eBay are these TX9 portables, even with the push buttons, which would normally be here or the remote control like this one. There were some that came with an AV input that you could use with home computers. In fact, let's have a look at that date stamp again. So this set here, this uh, one with the tambour door, was available in 1983. So you could have got this in 1983 should you uh, have wanted to rent that. 
Um, I would have. I rather like it. I would have quite happily given that li um, living room space, to be honest with you. So, coming near the end now, uh, we've got this weird little portable, which I think is another earlier TX9, with, I think, an ultrasonic remote. And that one would have been available to rent in 1983. I don't know if that's October. It could be October 83. So you've got the remote control. I think it was an ultrasonic remote, if I remember rightly. Yeah, ultrasonic remote control. Um, available with... What was it available with? Well, literally just the remote control. So, I'm not sure, what was the difference? Ah, yeah, there you go. So you had the 8171 was with remote. The 8170 without the remote, 8171 with the remote. I'm not sure why it's got two 8170s listed. I don't know if that's a typo or not, which is interesting. Or if it should be 8170, 8171. It's interesting that uh, that would have actually escaped proofreading and actually got through with that, but hey. And finally, another brochure excerpt for the Super Sound. So this one is actually a more conventional, uh, more modern finish instead of that sort of uh, woody sort of affair. And this one would have been available, I guess that's May 1984, if that's uh, anything to go by. Fully featured remote, um, available in 20 inches or 26 inches or more popular 22. Um, as I said earlier, the 26 inch only available on rental by all accounts. So if you had a 26 inch, you were, you know, you were renting it, but you were doing pretty well. Anyway, just thought we'd uh, go through those. I hope you found this interesting and a bit of a trip down memory lane. If you have, don't forget to hit that like button and also consider subscribing for more upcoming fascinating hobbies. Thanks for watching.